Troy Grosnick is a goalie, and he's now a goalie in the LA Kings organization after, what, last week? Troy, he joins us now too, by the way. Hello, how are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me, guys. Well, congratulations on signing with such a prestigious organization like the LA Kings. Uh, I imagine it's got to be nice to have that out of the way, maybe some unknowns in the future, but at least you know where you're going to be next year to an extent. Yeah, for sure. I mean, obviously, crazy times right now. Um, so anytime there's a, a little bit of a sense of clarity, it's, uh, it's nice to be able to hold on to that. And um, my family and I are really excited to get out to uh, the LA area and, uh, you know, get to work uh, for an incredible organization. Like you said, we're, uh, we're very excited. So I like to think of the Rainy Day podcast as more of a national program, but Let's just assume you haven't listened to an episode. We generally like to start with uh, with a would you rather, and we have two prepared because one's a little niche. Are you a golfer? Do you like golf? Do you golf? I'm a, I'm a big golfer. You're an avid golfer. All right, good. I'm glad to hear it. Okay, so here's your would you rather. Would you rather never be able to use a golf cart or hire a caddy or use one of the rollers for your bag? Like you're walking, it's on your back every time you golf for the rest of your life, or you can never wear flip-flops or shower sandals ever again for the rest of your life. That's you an easy one. I'll, oh, really? I'll, I'll carry my bag all day. Really? It's I, that easy I, for uh, me. Yeah, I like, I enjoy a walk and um, I've always, I've never really used a push cart or anything like that when I do walk. Um, so that one's easy for me. I like, I like when I'm golfing to be able to, you know, I don't like to be rushed or anything like that. I enjoy the walk and, um, so that one's a pretty easy one for me, I think. Wow, I'm sure. Zach, so are, are, you, are you a good golfer? Uh, I'm I'm all right. My uh, yeah, he's good. So when I was playing he's, in San Jose, my handicap was a little bit lower than it is now. But um, like I, this is actually the summer that I've golfed the least, but I kept my handicap in the seven eight range. So yeah, but you okay. you know what your handicap is, yeah. which to me <laughs> makes you a good golfer. Like I'm a, I'm a bad golfer, you know, like I, I, I want to go out and shoot a hundred and have a good time, have some, have some beverages on the course, which is, is challenging if you're carrying your bag, you know, to be then carrying a beer. Or you just got to drink them quick with then. It. No, it's not, <laughs> it's not enjoyable. So yeah, I, I, I'm kind of in that boat with you, Zach. Now, I, it would be miserable to not be able to wear sandals, you know, living in California, you know, when yeah, you go for to, sure. or something and like as that. As a hockey player with your feet crammed up in skates all the time, like sandals are clutch when you get to be able to let the feet breathe a little bit. So yeah, being, having to give up sandals, that would be a tough one for me. Yeah. So I think I, I would, think, Zach, go ahead. I would go, I would, I would, I would take the no golf cart. I, that's the route I would go because I wear sandals, I think pretty regularly, whereas I only golf, you know, selectively and I could be fine with walking, but I, I wouldn't, I would definitely, I think, golf less as a result of it. Yeah, so I, I would take the sandals and I would just give up golf because I would just won't golf without a cart. I just won't do it. <laughs> like I, I'm there to drink. I'm there, like that's what, <laughs> that's what golfing is to me. And I have a good time, and sometimes I hit them well, and, and usually I hit them bad. But I, I am there for the social aspect and and um, nothing else. So I, I could give up golf. I'll I will say though, I won't golf. use a push cart. I will, if I have the golf cart, I'm fine with it, but I will carry my bag over using one of those push carts. Yeah. That is, that is one thing wanna, for me. I don't want to carry the bag. I don't want, I'm not there to work out. So <laughs> I'm just giving up golf. Okay. All right. Let's jump into it. You've been in the AHL a long time. You've, you've had a cup of coffee in the NHL as well. Um, I want to, I know we're going to get back to Union College because Zach and I both like upstate New York quite a bit, but you started in Worcester um, with the Sharks. Started, you spent a long time in that organization. How'd you like Worcester, number one? I liked Worcester a lot. It was, um, you know, obviously I didn't know a lot about Worcester when, when we went out there. And um, it's really, it's really cool town. Like we, uh, when I lived there the first year, um, I was kind of had some roommates and we lived close to one of the colleges um, kind of like right by Becker and WPI. Um, and one thing about living in Worcester is like, there's tons of schools, um, like Holy Cross, like Worcester State, like there's tons of colleges, a big college town. Um, so that was cool. Like as a younger guy, 
and then um, my fiance, now wife, moved there with me my second year, and we lived kind of close to the lake, uh, Lake Quinn Sigamond, and it's uh, like that kind of borders Worcester and Shrewsbury. Shrewsbury is like a super, super nice affluent um, suburb, and um, just being able to hang around kind of like near the lake, um, it's pretty cool. And uh, the other thing that I was like shocked about Worcester is like, there's incredible restaurants there. Like you wouldn't, it's kind of like, it seemed like random. Um, obviously like you're 45 minutes from Boston, but um, the restaurants there were really good. Like there's sometimes Maggie and I will look at each other and like, oh, I wish I could go back to the Flying Rhino right now. Like um, <laughs> it was, it was, yeah. Like it was really, really good. Uh, really good food scene and um we loved our time there like i uh i love Worcester. i uh think that's the first time i've ever heard of uh, worcester referred to as a college town but i'll allow it i mean i guess there are a lot of colleges there but i don't know if it's, it's... yeah okay okay. <laughs> okay you got me it's not like the big college town but the amount of colleges that are there like there's there's always something going on like especially because I think I was like 24 or so at the time so like I was a younger guy and so it was cool to just kind of have that when I mean you're being told you're going to Worcester Massachusetts and you look it up and it's like oh well like it's like the second biggest city in Mass but like you don't really see a lot going on and um, it, it was like I was surprised and like very happy when I got there um, it was, it was a cool place to live. Polar Seltzer is based out of Worcester. Yeah, that's, that's actually, yeah, it's right by Holy Cross. Yeah. They, um, when I, I was in the ECHL, it was after you'd moved out here, Cam, but uh, they had Polar Seltzer, like, just stocked in the fridges in the press yeah. area in Worcester, which was great. And also maybe the best broadcast location in the ECHL, yeah. I which was cool. The... I, yeah, well, I know where it is. I, I, never, I had good experiences yeah, in Worcester. It was, it was a really nice rink, too. I, uh, I, a buddy of mine went to Holy Cross. And Holy Cross, very good school. And I, he grew up in Worcester. And if you grow up in Worcester and you get into Holy Cross, they give you a full ride, at least at that time, which I thought was pretty sweet. That's, so pretty, that's something yeah. about Worcester. And the only other thing about Worcester is I used to go to a lot of the, before you were there, uh, the Sharks games. And when I was, like, when I was in high school, and um, they had dollar dogs on Wednesdays. And that was the greatest Massachusetts minor league hockey uh, deal you could find. I remember, I think I've told this story of the podcast before, but I used to call down there on Wednesdays and be like, hey, do I need to buy a ticket? Like before I knew anything about the age, do I need to buy a ticket in, in advance? I don't want it to be sold out when I get there. Like, yeah, you're going to be fine. <laughs> awesome. Now I've been working in this sport for a little while and realize how ridiculous that call must have been to field. Um, so then let's move to San Jose and I'm going to ask this delicately. I mean, a guy that can find the silver lining in, in Worcester Mass can clearly maybe find something about that San Jose. So there aren't a lot of fans at Barracuda games. Now they're building this new arena and I'm sure that once that happens, they, you know, they kind of set up for failure with the fans where you play a lot of games before the NHL club, people are going to pick the NHL games to go to. So, you know what, like I got no, I have no problem with the organization. They, they treat us very well when we go up there, everything like that, whatever you want to say. Nice, 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 nice. But there's no fans at any of the games. What was that like to play your home games in San Jose with the Barracuda in front of less than 300 people sometimes? I maybe, I don't know the numbers. But. It was, it was kind of wild. I'm like, I'm not gonna lie. It's funny though, because so the very first home game, we had it was against Rockford and like the lower bowl was full and like there were even some like in the in the top and I, I mean I know like the Sharks and Barracuda like basically they kind of like really um pumped that up like this is the first time like the AHL team's playing here and um so, so that first game was actually like probably the most attended Barracuda game ever and we got kind of spanked and then all of a sudden like no the crowds weren't there but I think it's it's tough to have um that AHL team right in um in the NHL town especially when you're it's not what you would consider a traditional hockey market sure um I think it, it makes it a little bit harder 
Um, but the fans that did we did get were awesome. Like our season ticket holders when we were there, they were they were great, and um, we got to hang out with them a lot. Like we kind of got to know them kind of on a personal basis because I mean there there weren't a ton of them, and but the ones that we did have were very passionate about the Barracuda, and um, so it did make it fun to uh, kind of like establish relationships with your fans um that way but yeah my time in san jose like i i enjoyed it like it was you know the organization kind of you touched on like very first class people and where we were treated well and um you know it's uh it's a it's definitely you know that organization is kind of where i wet my boots in pro hockey so um you know i've i've got nothing but but good words to say about them obviously you know, it's a little bit of a rivalry now. And uh, when I signed, I, I made sure I texted Roy and, and Johnny Mack and Jimmy Bono and um, let them make, make sure that there's nothing easy this year. So um, it'll be fun to see those guys and compete against them. I like to think that they were just preparing for the COVID times with social distancing in the arena. You know what? I think they were just ahead of the times. You, I mean, you could be onto something there. That's it. That's, that's a, uh, it's a big cat ass spin zone that, that you that's got. All <laughs> well, about the spin zones and like, you know, that's, there's no better building in this league to prepare for partial crowds than that one. Yeah. You know, I, I'm not, I'm, those words aren't going to come out of my mouth, but um, yeah, like they're definitely ahead of the COVID times. It seems like. Now you, um, you were there for the playoff run there. I think it was your second year in San Jose and the, the place was pretty packed as you guys got into like the second round, wasn't it? Cause I recall like the sharks were out and then yep. it seemed like I was seeing some really cool, like lower bowl, like sellouts in San Jose then too. Yeah. So that was like, that was the only time that it really rivaled like that first game that we had. And um, it was cool. Cause you're right. The sharks lost in the first round and we were kind of the only hockey left in town so they were able to draw you know some of those fans into our games and I think they were doing specials kind of like the dollar dog type things but I think it was like dollar beers too and um so they so we definitely got some crowds for that and that was a uh, that run was a lot of fun that was a that was a special team to be a part of um obviously we came up a little bit short but um you know just looking at the names from from that roster and and there's a I mean Barkley Goodrow just won a cup. So, um, you know, it, it was a, it was a good team. It was a fun team. And uh, it was nice that, that some fans were able to come out and, and see us in the playoffs. So you played on, so can you hear me by the way? My, yep. my, uh, okay, great. This will uh, be something we edit out. Away. So, <laughs> so you played on uh, some pretty stud teams at union who I'll, I'll, um, never said it on this podcast, but at the time I owned it and said the ECAC, I couldn't stand it. And I thought it was like this joke. And then all these teams started coming out of it. You had like union was all of a sudden a stud Quinnipiac had all these awesome years at Yale. So all of a sudden ECAC is something to be reckoned with. You kind of were there right as it came up. And, you know, I, I, Zach, I know you're an ECAC guy too. I don't mean to be in. Look, I, I grew up in that area, and as a kid, like Union was terrible. I mean, like, yeah. Union was never any good, and it was RPI was always a little bit better. Union was like bottom of the conference, and then when you and that team got there, like Cam said, like you guys kind of put the program on the map a little bit. Yeah, it was like well, it was funny because I think like when I got out to Union um they the year before I got there was the first time they made like the final four of the conference tournament and um so like the the program was on the upswing um but I mean I grew up in in Wisconsin like big WCHA territory and like that was the you know growing up that way that's what I thought college hockey was like these huge stadiums and um then obviously going out east to actually play uh, it's a definitely a different feel but um, like the rivalries were just as intense and like I, I to this day I hate RPI um, but it's uh, it was a special time for sure and you know I was lucky enough to be kind of like in the sweet spot of of the union you know like kind of like the class before me my class and the class after me were like kind of like the big big classes that that unions ever had and 
Um, so yeah, it was great. It's like that team, like those, those guys, we still pretty much all keep in touch and, um, it's, it's a close knit, uh, fraternity. That's for sure. Um, but touching on like the ECAC, like I remember, like everyone would always say EZAC and, um, <laughs> it was like, we're like, I don't know, like this, our conference pretty good. And, um, so I think the year that would have been my junior year, we lost to Quinnipiac in the, in the, uh, national tournament, but we had won our conference tournament the third place game of the conference tournament was Quinnipiac and Yale and Quinnipiac won that game. And then the national final was Yale and Quinnipiac and Yale won that game. So it just like shows, you know, that conference, like, like you said, like, I think we ended up winning like two or three straight national championships there. Um, But that conference was definitely on the upswing and it's still good. It was great hockey. And, um, yeah, Yale, Quinnipiac, us, Cornell, Harvard was really good for a while there. Um, it, yeah, it, it's a strong conference. And, like, I think playing at Union in a really good conference behind a really good team obviously helped me turn pro. And um, the three years I spent there were some of the best of my life. Every dog has his day in ECAC, uh, maybe a few years there. It, it was – the honestly like how competitive top to bottom the league was was incredible like that same year my junior year we played brown in the tournament in our conference tournament final and i think they were the 12th seed like they were the last seed in the in the conference tournament and they they took it to the championship game and we were lucky enough or or i don't know if lucky but we uh we were able to top them but it just shows like it seemed like it happened every year i know my freshman year, I think we were the one seed and Colgate upset us in the first, in our first round. Like, um, it was just a really, really good conference top to bottom. And it was fun to be a part of. The only thing I, the only compliment that I will give the ECAC, I know it's a good, uh, good conference, but the, uh, Shane Gostas Bear is the best player I ever saw play a game in college hockey. Like I saw a lot of people play. I, I went to hockey school for four years I saw Gaudreau I saw the very good ones but in a single game I feel like it was Union at UNH and I think Union won and Gostas Bear that was the best player I ever saw play like you see a single game a good performance he was he should have won the Hobie Baker in my opinion so yeah Ghost Ghost is a special player like so he was the class right behind me um I remember when he came in as a freshman, like captain skates and stuff, and he's doing some of this crazy stuff. And we're like, this guy's going to get run over because he was a twig. And we're like, this guy tries it in a game like he's he's toast. And then all of a sudden he was doing it in games and we're like, wow, like this guy is special. He's a player. Another funny ghost story is so the year after I left is the year they won the national championship and ghost was plus seven in a seven four win. And we literally didn't realize it until like it came up. Somebody texted the group like literally like a week or something like that ago. And we failed to realize that Jeff Taylor was plus five in that game, but ghost was plus seven. So Jeff never got any of the, the hoopla because ghost went plus seven in, in a seven, four win. But yeah, you're right. Like he was a very special player and you know, he's uh, a, Obviously, like things are are what they are in Philly, but I hope that he's able to, you know, find a spot and, uh, you know, get back on track because he's definitely one of the most talented players I've ever played with. You bring up Jeff Taylor, who's from, you know, the, the 518 area. So don't don't go too hard on my region. I'm, uh, I grew up in Latham. I lived in that area most of my life. How did you like, you know, the social side of living, you know, and maybe not the nicest city in Schenectady, but, you know, pretty pretty cool area in my opinion yeah no it was it was a cool area and obviously like people will say what they want about schenectady but like the union campus was incredible and you know it's not like we really got off campus a ton um but i loved it there it it really like upstate new york reminded me a lot of of home like in wisconsin just you know the fall colors the four seasons and 
um, just the people in general. Like I think sometimes like people from the Midwest, you might assume like going out to the East Coast, like everything's hustle bustle and and a little bit more rude. But I found it like like people in upstate where New York were, you know, they were just like people back home and like just polite and easy going, nice people. And um, yeah, like upstate New York has a has a soft spot in my heart. Like we one of my best friends got married up there on Lake George and like it's awesome. Like we uh we try to get up to Saratoga when we can and visit our friends that are still in that area. And um yeah, we love it up there. Yeah. We're we're all yeah, we're gonna get we're gonna become the Adirondack podcast pretty soon because it is a good area. <laughs> <laughs> we, we all uh the upstate New York's a great spot. No, you know, take a vacation there, go see the horses, go to Lake George for a day, have a great time. And then, uh, and then in the winter, just come back to California. So yeah, that's, you know, that's, that's been the story of my life other than, uh, you know, when I was out in San Jose, like it, it's generally pretty cold in the, in the hockey playing uh, States. Um, let's talk about the time you were traded, which was in February of 2018, uh, right around the deadline. Was that the deadline that year or was it a little bit? Yeah, it was, I, I got traded the day before the deadline. Okay. So let's you know, talk us through that day. Did you know it was, I, was coming? Okay. I had no idea. It was kind of crazy. We, so my son was around three months old at the time. I remember, um, earlier that week saying something to my wife I, I said something like Maggie like this is a year like we don't really have to worry about anything like I don't see anybody trading for us or, or anything like that and then I uh it was kind of weird like I was supposed to be taking uh Emerson Clark back to the apartment complex and all of a sudden Joe Will kind of said Troy like I need to talk to you and I, like that wasn't out of the ordinary. Like I would talk to Joe, you know, it, that just in and of itself wasn't, wasn't weird. But then he said, we got to go up to the office. And then I was like, Oh man, like I stepped into the office and the whole coaching staff was up there and Joe was up there. And that's when it kind of hit me. I was like, Oh man, I'm getting traded. And so they told me, and um, at the time, like it was like, it was hard to, to leave all those, all those people. Like I, you know, I became a pro with all, with all those people around and they be, had become close. And um, what softened the blow was that I was going to Nashville and I was going home to Milwaukee. And um, so my first call was, was to Maggie and to say, Hey, we got to start packing stuff up. And my second call was, was to my parents and, and to my mom. And that was a really cool call. Um, like my mom's a pretty, pretty like, uh, I mean, I don't want to call her stoic, but she doesn't show emotions. Like, all the time and you know she started bursting into tears so um being able to make that call and tell her tell him i'm coming home and with a grandson in tow was uh that was a pretty cool call and obviously got out there a couple days later and started uh <laughs> maggie maggie stayed back with beckett and uh, my mother-in-law helped pack up and i had to get out to milwaukee right away so i spent the first week um at my parents' house and sleeping in the bed that uh, I had grown up in. So it was a, it was a pretty cool uh, whirlwind of a week. It's funny how that works out sometimes. Like you're not expecting a trade last thing on your mind, but in a way, you know, it creates a, a special memory for you that you might not have had otherwise. Yeah, for sure. And that's exactly what the case was. Like I, you know, I think at the time people had like speculated that I had asked to be traded just because I was going back home, but it was a complete blind side. I had no idea it was coming. So, so you, oh, oh, go ahead, please. Um, so you know, you're in Milwaukee for two and a half years, you know, and you decide this off season, you know, to sign with the Kings organization. What, why did you sign with the Kings? You know, there's always different reasons that people make, you know, the choices they do when you have options. And then what, what drove you to LA? Uh, I mean, I think it is like a hockey decision. Um, I just felt like it was an opportunity for, for me to kind of, you know, nothing's ever handed to you or anything like that, but like, it was it just, I thought it presented an, a better opportunity, a better chance for me to, make it into the NHL and to stick in the NHL 
um, at some point than what was, um, you know, what, than what the Nashville organization has going on. And um, it was, that, that was pretty much the pure decision. I know I'm an older guy and, um, you know, don't have a ton of NHL games or experience, but I feel like I can be, you know, kind of a veteran leader down in the American league and, you know, you never wish injuries upon anybody, but if something were to happen up top, like I, I feel like I can kind of come in and fill that role um, with the experience that I do have. And, um, you know, Nashville, the situation was a little different than, than it is in LA. They got Connor who had a really good year this year and um, they're pretty set up top with, with Pax and Juice. So um, Juice is a, is a young guy too. And it just seemed like a, it's time to make a, a change. And um, I, like LA was at the top of my list, like when I was kind of running through um, where openings might be. And so I couldn't be more grateful that uh, that's where I ended up. You're a seasoned pro at this point. So I don't, you know, I think you'll have a probably good answer to this, but your second year in the league in the AHL, you get two NHL games, you let in three goals in those two NHL games. And then, you know, again, I assume at this point, you probably have a different mindset about it, but you didn't get back after that. You've had calls, but you haven't played a game. Does it, and it may, again, maybe this is a loaded question, the wrong way of asking it, but did it irritate you at the time or for the next few years that I went up there was a stud goalie in the NHL and I haven't yet gotten back there, at least uh, maybe especially being in San Jose at that time. Yeah, I don't, I don't think so. Um, I never thought about it that way. I knew when I got called up that I was probably going to get a chance. Um, I also knew that I probably wasn't going to be up very long. Um, Al had a quick scope procedure done and I knew it was going to be like two or three weeks, but um, I actually, ended up getting hurt myself, which kind of ended the run. And um, it, it took me a while to kind of come to peace with that, um, that that's how it ended. And, um, you know, I struggled through and, and, you know, my next year after that wasn't, wasn't very good. Like I, I was just, you know, I think I had to mature a little bit and, and say to myself, like, yeah, you got to prove that you can be back up there. Um, and it's something that, that I'm still striving to do. Like, obviously, I've had some good years, um, but the opportunities haven't presented themselves. But um, I think what that experience has taught me is that when you do have that opportunity, like, you got to be sure that you're ready to make it count. And um, I feel like that's been my attitude the last three or four years. And, um, you know, it doesn't matter what league you're in. If you're in the American League or the NHL, like, you got to bring your best every night. And... Uh, that's that's kind of been the motto the mo for the last last four years so that the time you did have you know with the sharks like for one night like everyone in the hockey world knew who troy grosnick was like how special was that moment you know to have one of the best debuts that anyone's ever had in the nhl like what was that moment that experience like it was crazy like i mean it, it, like the, the coolest part was that my family was able to get there and see it on kind of short notice and um, just being able to like share that with that whole thing with them. Like my brother who shot pucks on me in my basement and out in the driveway. And uh, obviously my parents who carted me all over the Midwest and North America to go play hockey tournaments and just being able to like share that. Even I, I only got to see him for like 20 minutes after the game because we had to go up to Buffalo right away. But just being able to, like, sit there in that moment was uh, – that's the thing that I'll cherish the most. Like, honestly, if it wasn't for, you know, like, once in a while, like, somebody will send me, like, oh, remember when you did this and, like, the highlights. Like, I don't really remember much of the game itself, but I remember just being able to share um, share that time after with my family. And, and that's really what was special about it to me. Um, all right, let's talk about some goalie guy stuff. We ask, I think, every goalie that comes on this question, and uh, whether it be junior or college, or, have you ever scored a goal? Uh, no, not as a goalie. All right, well, it's kind of a dream of mine as a broadcaster to call one of these. I've been doing this for now, including college, like nine years. So now that you're maybe going to play. I'll try my best for you. I ask every <laughs> single guy. You <laughs> just... Just one, just one goal. See what happens. Um, we ever close? We ever uh, have like a close call? 
I've actually never even tried to shoot at an empty net in a game. Um, everyone, this past year, there was a chance, like I did, a puck did get dumped down on me, but, and I was thinking about it, but just the way everything had progressed, like the entire other team was in the neutral zone. And I was like, there's no way that I can clear everybody with this. So like, I'll just pass it off to my defenseman. And I was, I was happy enough at that point to get the win. So, yeah. um, yeah. but it's, uh, yeah, I, I, I remember like that game that like that play vividly, like I caught the puck, I looked up and I wanted to go for it, but I was like, there's, there's just not really a lane there for me to, to do it. So, yeah. um, decided I would pat I actually think I got an assist on the play if I remember right um so I passed it off the defenseman and let him do his thing was it a yeah. one goal game or a two goal game uh I believe that was a one goal game. okay I can live with uh, it yeah <laughs> yeah if it's a two goal game though and we're just let's keep it in mind um it's funny, then... <laughs> it's funny you mentioned that though because when I was with San Jose we were playing against Milwaukee it it was the game in San Jose and I believe Mazinek was their goalie he went for an empty net buried it into Ryan Carpenter's chest and Carpy had a tap in and so now we're down by one with about a minute left and like he went for it again and I was like man this guy's got some cojones like yeah. after what just happened but um we weren't able to get get a get a goal so he still got the win but I remember like that was one that I I was like good on and like he might have messed one up, but he's still going to keep shooting. Yeah. Law of averages. I know the answer to the second one. I know you've been in a fight. Um, can you walk us through that situation? Yeah. So it was something like I always wanted to have a goalie fight. Like that was probably number one on my list before the goal. Um, so we've got that checked off now, which is nice. And it was just honestly, it was. Um, something I always wanted to do. I knew Tompkins had had one before it was a game that had kind of gotten out of hand. Um, and literally like there was a little scrum going on, but I kind of was like, well, this is my opportunity. So I kind of sh shook the gloves at him and he said, yeah. And you know, away we went and uh, yeah, it was a, uh, it was a blast. <laughs> was there, so was there like when, when the goalies fight sometimes it seems like half the time they're like laughing while they're doing it. Yeah, I think during the fight, we weren't laughing. Um, but after, like, I saw him after the game, after we both uh, got undressed in the locker room and we had a good chuckle about it, it was, uh, it was all in good fun. But it, it's one of those things that you don't know if the opportunity will present itself. And, um, like, I was, I was really happy that, that it was able to. The one thing was my – the, the cool thing was it was, like um, – I think it was either a concert night or like the badger band night which is like some of the big draws um that milwaukee gets so it was a packed house so and we were we were up like seven to two or six to two or something like that so it just seemed like the perfect time to do it and uh i think the only person that was unhappy with me was my mom you just had to be buzzing for that one like you get the that's a perfect it's like a perfect storm yeah it was like i was i was amped up for it for sure um so it was it was good yeah my mom just called me a naughty boy after the game but um <laughs> other than that you know uh it was it was good here's my goalie question it's not nearly as exciting as cams but it's something i always like to ask goalies when a shooter is coming down on you and the shooter uses black tape on their stick does it actually make it harder to save or is that a complete myth i i don't think it does um i find you're more apt to lose the puck in like in like black pants or black jerseys than you are on black tape. Um, just because the puck is, is literally on the ice. So it's surrounded by white. So you can see it. So, so the tape thing to me, I think is a little bit of a myth, but if, uh, if a guy on our team thinks that he's going to score a couple extra goals because he's using black and not white, then more power to him. Like I want him to have that confidence. Well, welcome to hell, because now you got five guys in black jerseys and yes. black pants and black gloves defending your cage. Yeah, no, it's it's not that bad. It's it's really not. It doesn't happen often, but it's more apt to happen in that stuff than it is on the on the blade. 
Um, so I want to end with one, just since you spent some time in the Pacific, obviously, what, where do you feel is the hardest place to play has, has been the hardest place to play? Actually, I'll ask you in the Pacific and then maybe, maybe with Milwaukee, there's something else that stands out, but in this league, maybe a loud place, something like that. Yeah. I, so you're asking kind of like, I, I love, like, I, I don't know if it's cause I'm a goalie or, or, you know, that's kind of like our mantra is like we our goal is to deny yours basically like but I've always gotten kind of like a little bit of extra juice when I do play on the road and like it's a it's a rowdy fan base so like I always loved playing down in Ontario and and San Diego um, because I felt like the fans were always engaged and loud when we played there so those would be like honestly my two in the Pacific Division and then out in the central, I'd say Grand Rapids. I was always pretty jacked up to play in Van Andel Arena. They always, you know, their fans were great there. And um, it was nice to, to send them home unhappy. Fair enough. Okay. Yeah, that's probably a good place to end, Zach. Some good brownie points with the, yeah. Yeah, with you the faithful in our organization area. for that statement, too. No, but it was true. Like, I, like, you guys had that, especially I think it was that first year that we were out there like you guys were really good like you tore us apart in the playoffs I remember um so yeah like I like Ontario like the two toughest like toughest or loudest it was easily there in, in San Diego um like was nothing we were nothing Bake, Bako didn't <laughs> really have much going on yeah so i don't know if you so it wasn't the strongest competition that that we're going up against but sure. yeah I, I can i can live with that all right let, okay I'll, I'll i'll lie i'll ask one more you guys you or you personally i know you weren't with the organization but you spent five years with roy summer you must have been pretty excited when he finally got to stand behind that nhl bench after what over two decades uh, with the, yeah the organization. roy is like <laughs> he's one of a kind man. Like he's, uh, he's honestly one of the most genuine, like human beings and nice human beings, um, that I've ever met. And like, we stayed in contact even after, um, I was traded and he was one of the first to kind of reach out and say, Hey, welcome back to California. And he was like, I wish it wasn't there. I, I wish I didn't have to play against you, but, um, welcome back. And, I mean, I think everyone's got Roy's stories and um, he's just, he's just a character. And uh, I, I always thought it was funny. Like he would always tell me when we went into shootouts that he would never, never watch. He would just go by the reaction of the crowd. And um, that's just, that's just Roy, man. Like he's uh, something, he's a, he something funny for his NHL debut or. Yeah. He, so he wears, so he's like a straight up cowboy. Like he has a place in Montana like I think it didn't even have like electricity till I don't know a few years ago. <laughs> he always so he always spends his summers up there. He's actually up there with uh, with Mo right now, and um, yeah. So he wore bolo ties. Um, he wore bolo ties for that first game that he was back up in the NHL. Uh, I think like it might have been like I remember he would bring out the bolo ties. He's got a, a few of them. But uh, he would bring it out for the big games, the ones that, that we really needed um, with the Barracuda. And I, there's a story. I, I think the one that he actually wore um, in that first NHL game, I think, was the one he wore at his wedding, too. So, Ooh, yeah, he's a, he's a character for sure. Wow. So, hey, that's another thing that I couldn't pull it off. I would never try it. I wouldn't be able to do it well, so. Good on him. You can make it Good happen. On him. Yeah. All right, Troy Grossnick, thanks for coming on. We'll look forward to seeing you here in uh, Southern California sooner or later. Have a good uh, rest of your, I guess it's an off season. Um, and, uh, and I'm sure we'll talk to you soon. Thanks for the time. Oh, thanks for having me guys. Okay.